The text for this morning's sermon is Ephesians 3, the verses 14 to 21. It's a prayer that Paul prays to the Father in heaven uh, for the church that Jesus Christ has claimed as his own. Ephesians 3, beginning at verse 14. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than, we, than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church, and in Christ Jesus, throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, we have passed from one year into the next. 2022 is behind us, and 2023 has just begun. The end of a year is a good time for reflection and evaluation. The entrance into a new year is an opportunity for a reset. People often make New Year's resolutions in which they commit themselves to losing weight or getting exercise. While such bodily pursuits have benefit, what about our spiritual life? Have you or are you ready? to make a renewed commitment to knowing God and living in close communion with Him. In his letter to the Ephesians, Paul speaks about the spiritual blessings that God has granted us in Jesus Christ. These blessings include being chosen by God, being adopted as His sons and daughters, receiving the forgiveness of sins, being sealed with the Holy Spirit, sharing in eternal life. All these are ours in Christ. They're given by grace alone, without any merit on our part. That should make us incredibly thankful. It should cause us to love God with all our heart, to serve Him according to His word. Yet, beloved, if we're honest with ourselves, we're not always living in a close relationship with God. It's not that we don't love the Lord or that we don't desire to be in close communion with Him. But at times, the busyness of life distracts us from regular feeding on His Word, from communing with Him in prayer. At times, because of struggles and hardships in our lives, we get discouraged. God seems to be so far away. Despite praying about my struggles, they don't seem to go away. I believe what the Bible says about the incredible blessings that God gives to his saints. But maybe I don't deserve them. I'm not worthy to receive them. And so we get discouraged from pursuing a close, an intimate relationship with our Heavenly Father. So why this morning we're going to examine Paul's prayer for the church. He prays an impassioned prayer that everything we've heard about God's grace and His spiritual blessings may be realized in our hearts and lives. He prays that each of us may share in the blessings of Christ our Savior. It's a prayer that we need to pray, especially at the beginning of New Year. I preach to you God's word under the following theme. 
Paul teaches us to pray that we may experience all Christ's spiritual blessings in our lives. We are to pray that God may strengthen us with his spirit, may empower us to grasp Christ's love, and may enable us to glorify him. Our text begins with Paul showing that he's drawing near to God in prayer. He says, for this reason I bow my knees before the Father. It's worth noting Paul's posture for prayer. It was not customary for Jews to kneel in prayer. The normal Jewish posture for prayer was to stand. You can still see pious Jews doing that in front of the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem today. Kneeling indicates an extraordinary event or an unusual passion. King Solomon knelt on a wooden platform before all the people when he prayed at the dedication of the temple. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus fell to the ground in agonized emotion when he prayed to his father for help on the night when he was betrayed. When Paul prays the prayer recorded in our text, he kneels, he bows down before our Father in heaven. Paul does so because he is filled with emotion. He is humbled by the riches of God's grace, through which he has called both Jews and Gentiles to be his beloved people. Paul is deeply thankful for the wondrous blessings that the church has received in Christ. For it's only through Christ's saving work that we who were sinners, aliens, and outcasts are now adopted as God's dear children, members of his household. Even before he begins praying, Paul wants to remind us of our connection to God. He wants to assure us that when we pray, we're not wasting our time pleading with a God who doesn't know us or care about us. Paul addresses God as Father to remind us that because of Christ's redeeming work, the gap between God and us has been bridged. Our sins no longer form an obstacle that drives a wedge between God and us. In Christ, the Father has been brought near to us so that we may draw near to him. Paul prays that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Paul heaps phrase upon phrase, and as a result, it's not hard to lose the main thought of what he's praying for. It is that God may strengthen you through his spirit in your inner being. It's a prayer for spiritual strength and power. To understand this, we need to remember that by nature, we are dead in our transgressions and sins. Yet God came into our lives with the gospel. He regenerates us. He causes us to be born anew. He changes us from people who were dead in sin to people who are now alive in Christ. Our inner being is renewed so that more and more we can image Christ in our lives. God turns us from bad trees that don't produce any fruit into good, tre- into good trees which produce the fruits of faith. So why do we need God to strengthen us through his spirit in the inner being? Because he knows how weak we are. How desperately we need the power of his spirit to work in us. We are like people who have lived in slavery all their lives. And were suddenly set free. It's a really hard transition to make. God's people Israel struggled to live as free people. After God delivered them from Egypt. They kept falling back into slavery, worshipping idols rather than the living God. We see the same thing happening in the world in which we live. Think about those who have lived for generations 
under a totalitarian state. Think, for example, of those who lived under communist rule. The state regulated pretty much every aspect of their lives. It demanded you to work hard. It provided the basic housing and necessities of life. But there was no freedom. You were not allowed to go out and set up your own business. You're not encouraged to think for yourself or to develop new things. You did as you were told. When the Iron Curtain collapsed, people were set free. Many of the jobs that were available under the old regime disappeared. Those who wanted were allowed to take care, to take over state factories or to develop their own businesses. But that was hard. People were not used to the idea that they were free. They didn't think like free people. They were used to doing as they were told. Certain people took advantage of this. Corruption set in. Mafia bosses replaced the old communist ones. And many, while free, continued to live in virtual slavery. That, beloved, is a good picture of our lives. Spiritually, we were all once slaves to sin. Yet in Christ, God has chosen us to be his own. He has redeemed us through Christ's blood. We're now members of God's household. We're sons and daughters of the great king. But so often we still think like slaves. We're inclined to live according to the sinful nature. We follow in the sinful practices of those in the world around us. According to the world, success is measured by a good job, lots of money, a nice house, looking attractive, being popular, having fun. We tend to buy into society's attitudes that buying stuff will make us happy, that looking good will make us attractive, that fun is found in partying. Much of our striving is focused on outward things. We slave after things that in the end are superficial and shallow, things that do not give true or lasting joy. The Christian life is all about learning to think and to live like free people. The true blessings of God are not found in the material things of life. God's greatest gift to us is that he sent his dear son into this world as our redeemer. In Christ we share all the blessings of God. We can live in communion with him. We can share in all his riches, life eternal, righteousness, and glory. Our inner being needs to be transformed. We need to be strengthened with power through the Spirit in our hearts. How does God strengthen us? Paul prays that God may do so out of his glorious riches that his grace in Christ may take root in our heart, that we may know ourselves to be God's redeemed and renewed people, so that we no longer think and act as slaves, but rather as free people. Beloved, sin is no longer your master. Through Christ's death and resurrection, Satan no longer has mastery over you. As Lord's Day 1 says it, we belong with body and soul to our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from all the power of the devil. Do you believe that? Then live as if it were so. Why do you look with a covetous eye at your neighbor's material goods when God promises you more than you could ever desire in him? 
Why do you spend so much energy on the pursuit of things? At the cost of developing close relationships with loved ones and friends? Why get so busy in life that we don't make time for communion with God through Bible reading, study, and prayer? Our focus and attention are too often on the material things of this life and not enough on our spiritual blessings in Christ. And thus with Paul, we need to pray that out of his glorious riches, God may strengthen us, that he fill us with power through his spirit and our inner being, that Christ may dwell in our hearts. We're to pray that the indwelling of Christ may affect every part of our lives, that Christ's influence in us may be evident in our lives, that we find joy and peace and hope in him, that through his power, our lives are transformed so we can live as happy, as confident children of God, comforted, comforted in knowing we belong to him, secure in knowing that he will care for us. Our prayer is that our lives may be transformed so that we give glory to God in all we say and do. It brings us to our second point, and it will see that we are to pray that God may empower us to grasp Christ's love. In his prayer, Paul again piles phrase upon phrase. He prays that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and height, the breadth and length and height and depth, to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Paul is praying for God to grant us all we need to share in Christ's love. Paul speaks first about being rooted and grounded in love. As a tree has roots that go deep into the ground to provide stability through the fiercest storm, so we as God's people are firmly rooted in Christ's love. As a large building stands firm, established on a solid foundation, so we as church are grounded on Christ and his love. Our being and our well-being depend completely on Christ's sacrificial love, shown for us with his death on the cross. Paul goes on to pray that we may grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Many of us think that we understand what love is, yet we fall infinitely short. Often we view love in a fallen, in a self-centered way. I'll love you if you love me. I'll love you as long as you do what I think you should do. It's this sort of love that causes struggles in our relationships. Our love is often given on the condition that the other does what we want them to do. But Christ's love is completely different. He doesn't love us only when we are doing what he wants us to do. He loves us even when we fall short of God's will. Just think of what Paul writes in Romans 5. He says that Christ died for the ungodly. Christ's love is seen in that while we were still sinners, Christ gave himself up for us. He made the supreme sacrifice for us while we were his enemies. Despite the fact that we're not really all that lovable, Christ loved us with a deep sacrificial love, which he showed by dying on the cross for our sins. Paul wants us to have strength to comprehend the extent of God's love for us. Another translation speaks about having the power to grasp the love of Christ, the love of God. Paul wants us not just to understand, but to fully experience God's love. He wants us to know about this not just intellectually with our minds, 
but also emotionally in our hearts. You can tell a young child not to touch a hot stove because otherwise he'll burn his finger. But he won't really understand what it means to burn his finger until he touches that stove. It's the experience of a burnt finger that gives him a new type of understanding. It's no longer just head knowledge. It's knowledge gained through experience. Beloved, we need to know the love of God that way. Think of God's people living in the Old Covenant. God redeemed them from slavery in Egypt. He provided them with a land flowing with milk and honey. He established a covenant with them, and he came to live among them. They had every blessing imaginable. Yet they did not comprehend God's love for them. They departed from his ways. They did not heed the warning of his prophets. In the end, God led them into exile to further reveal his love for them. Isaiah was one of the prophets who spent most of his ministry warning and admonishing God's covenant people because of their sins. But he was also allowed to give comfort for the time when they were exiled. In Isaiah 40, you can read of the comfort Isaiah gives about how God would come back and restore his people, being their shepherd, caring for them. Isaiah needs to deal with the people's shock of being exiled with all the questions that they had. They could not understand how Yahweh, the God of the covenant, could allow his people to be taken from his land, to be made captives of godless nations. They thought that either God was not powerful enough to deliver them, or else that God no longer loved them enough to care for them. And so Isaiah speaks about God being the creator of this world, the sovereign king over all of life. It is he who sits above the circle of the earth and all its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. God is in full control of the kings and rulers of the earth. He governs over the stars and the night sky. In other words, his power is infinite. Isaiah also answered the people's complaint that their way was hidden from the Lord, that their so-called just cause was disregarded by their God. He speaks words of promise about how God gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. They who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. God had not forgotten his people. He still loved them with a deep and an abiding love. He would redeem. He would restore them. The people of Israel did not grasp the depth of God's love for them until the Lord brought them back from exile and reestablished the covenant with them. God dealt with them in a way that no other nation on earth had ever experienced. Where else in history do you read of a subjugated people being set free, allowed to return to their own land, being given money and material to rebuild their city and their temple? God brought all this about because of his deep, his abiding love for his people. We too, beloved, often do not learn things well except by experience. At times we wonder about the struggles and trials and adversities that God brings upon us. Intellectually, we know of God's love for us in Jesus Christ. We've heard his promises about forgiving our sins and allowing us to live in close communion with him. Scripture speaks plainly about God's promises to strengthen the weak, to comfort the distressed, to give hope to those who are despairing. But still, we often live far from the embrace 
of Christ's love. Paul wants us to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, to experience it as a reality in our lives, to seize, to attain, to win, to make it our own. At times, if we get to answer the question, does God love me? With a yes or no answer, we'd say no. Because we don't feel all that lovable. Because we think we're unworthy. Because we're bogged down with the struggles of life. But beloved, God does not love us because of anything that we've done or not done. He loves us because of what Christ has done. God's love for us is not based on our merit, but on Christ's sacrificial love shown in his death on the cross. Do you know how wide and long and high and deep the love of Christ is? The width of Christ's love is immense. It extends to every tribe and nation and language and people. It covers every sin and need and care and situation. The length of Christ's love is eternal. It existed from when God chose us before the foundation of the world, and it will continue forevermore. The height of Christ's love is infinite. It extends from earth up into the highest heavens. The depth of Christ's love is unfathomable. It caused him to stoop down to our level. Jesus was willing to become man, to suffer and even die, to save us from our sins. Measuring Christ's love is impossible. But God wants us to know this love to be filled with it. Paul prays that we may know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Paul is asking that we be filled with the God of love and with the love of God. The result will be that we live in close communion with God, expecting all good things from his fatherly hand. If filled with God's love, we will live in true harmony with all those who make up the household of God and will show forth love to all those around us. Beloved, we all desire this, don't we? Well, to grasp Christ's love, you need to make him the center of your life. You need to live for him who died for you. You need to spend time with him every day, reading God's word, calling on him in your prayers. You need to study the scriptures in your family devotions and in the company of other believers. Are we doing that, beloved? How do you expect to experience God's love without regularly and diligently opening his word and reading and pondering on his awesome deeds. In many of our families, we do not regularly devote time for daily devotions. At times, our communal Bible study groups struggle. Many do not attend or only do so occasionally when they feel like it. Where is the desire, the zeal, the commitment? What wrong priorities exist in your life that prevent you from doing what you can to take hold of the love of Christ and make it your own? It is through his word that God makes himself known to us. It's through the word that Christ assures us of his love. If we're not busy with the Bible, it's hard 
to hold on to all the spiritual blessings that are ours in Christ. Beloved, be busy with the Word of God. Pray for God's Spirit to strengthen and encourage you through it. It's the only true source of comfort and joy. It brings us to our final point. Paul has been teaching us to pray that we experience all Christ's spiritual blessings in our lives. To pray that God may strengthen us with His Spirit and empower us to grasp Christ's love. If we do that, God will certainly hear our prayers and allow us to, allow us to experience a full measure of the blessings that are ours in Christ. Our text includes with Paul teaching us to pray that God may enable us to glorify Him. The last verses of our text contain two main thoughts. First, Paul wants to assure us that when we pray, our prayers will be heard and answered by God. Paul speaks about how God is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think. We often think too little of God Perhaps the struggles of life have jaded us. Could be that we've prayed many prayers and that God has not granted us what we desire. It can create doubt in our hearts about God's ability to help us. Yet Paul assures us that God is able to do much, much more than we ask of Him. His power is limitless. He can grant blessings and gifts beyond our wildest dreams. God was able to redeem his people from slavery in Egypt and grant them the promised land as their own inheritance. He redeemed his people and restored them to their own land after they'd been exiled by foreign world powers. God perfectly executed his plan of salvation, sending his son into this world to suffer and die for our sins. He raised Christ from the dead and exalted him at his right hand as King of kings and Lord of lords. When praying, we should not doubt either God's ability or his willingness to grant us an abundance of spiritual blessings. Well, what's our response to that? (coughs) Paul shows us the way. In the final verse of our text, Paul leads us into glorifying God for the abundance of blessings he provides for us. Paul says, To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. God has taken us from death to life, from slavery to freedom, from darkness into his marvelous light. As his redeemed and renewed people, We owe him everything. Christ is a source of life and joy and comfort and peace. Do you recognize that, beloved? Are you thankful? Do you praise God for his wondrous works for us and in us? Today we begin a new year. We don't know what this year will bring. We don't know if God will bless us with many good things or if he'll confront us with struggles, sorrows, trials, and adversity. What we do know is that we are the dearly loved children of our Father in heaven. That no matter what happens in life, he will sustain and support us. Our prayer is that we may experience ever more deeply God's love for us in Christ Jesus and that we may live in close communion with him. Our prayer is that God's love may lead us to glorify and praise him for his abounding grace towards us. Amen.